Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Contractor Evolution. This is Benji. I hope you're having a great day. Business is a pressure cooker as it is. Running said business with your father, mother, son, daughter, nephew, cousin, etc., adds yet another layer of complexity that only those working in family businesses understand. As if the rigmaroles of organizational life weren't enough, now you need to do all that with someone you've likely known since birth and vice versa, someone who knows your insecurities, your fears, what buttons to push if they want to make you mad, but simultaneously someone you love and cherish and whose existence in your life matters in the long run. So it's tricky, right? How do you maintain professional, productive working relationships during business hours? Hours, and then slide into loving, tender, and nurturing family relationships the rest of the time. Then comes the question of succession planning. Who is going to run the business when mom and dad retire? How do we structure and prepare for that transition? There's a lot to unpack here, which is why we're very fortunate to have David C. Bental on the show today. For two decades, David worked in his family's real estate and construction business, Dominion Construction. During his tenure as president and CEO, the business doubled in size to just under 300 million in sales. That's a big business. He also played a leading role in the development and construction of landmark projects across Canada, including GM Place, now known as Rogers Arena, which is where the Canucks play, um, and the TD Center office complex in downtown Winnipeg. He was also a super key player in the successful Vancouver 2010 Olympic bid. He is the author of Leaving a Legacy and the founder of Next Steps Advisors. He and his team have been advising family enterprises for 25 years and have worked with over 180 families in that time. Today's conversation is all about how to run a successful business with your family and plan for the succession that will one day take place. I hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. David, it's good to see you. Welcome to Contractor Evolution. Thanks, Benji. Good to be with you. Yeah, thanks for coming. So for our listeners who don't know kind of the, the Bental family story and don't know about Next Step Advisors and you and your body of work, can you give us a brief uh, summary overview of your family, your personal story, your journey till now, and then the work that you do today. A hundred years in f yes. less than five minutes. Yes. Yeah? So grandpa came from England in 1908. It was a structural engineer designed in 1911, the tallest building in the British Empire. Still in Vancouver, most people would recognize the Sun Tower, yep. originally the world newspaper building. So grandpa made a bit of a splash shortly after he arrived here. And then he bought a company called Dominion Construction. So technically, he didn't found the family construction sure. company that I ended up working with and my dad worked with. But granddad was a, a man of great integrity, a man of great vision. And he built a company such that he was actually honored to be invited into the Canadian Business Hall of Fame. So that's my grandpa. Yeah. Uh, my dad joined the family firm in 1938, just prior to the war. And he worked for the family company, Benji, 50 years, 5-0, 1938 okay. to 1988. And both grandpa and my dad transitioned this construction company into, first of all, a design build company. So we built General Motors Place when I was president of the company. We built that on a design build basis. The vast majority of our work was done design build. But then in addition to that, we started doing real estate development. So for example, in the 1930s, in the middle of the Depression, we did our first real estate development. We built a building for, for General Motors just prior to the Depression. We had a new one designed for them for Calgary. And they said, hold on, we don't have the money. Great and timing. My, yeah, and my grandpa said, well, how about if we build it and lease it to you? And our VP finance said to my grandpa, Charlie, are you out of your mind? If the largest corporation in the industrial world doesn't have the money to build the building, <laughs> I don't like, think we do. like why would we be doing it? And my grandpa uh, brilliantly said, if the largest corporation in the industrial world will sign the lease, why wouldn't we? Yeah. So we started in the real estate business 
in the middle of the depression. Crazy. So, that, you know, then over the years, we started building shopping centers. So when Safeway came to town, we built 25 Safeways, opened one every month for 25 months. So and there was surplus land, so we ended up building shopping centers around Safeway stores. And then dad and grandpa built the first Bentall building in 1949. And over time, my dad got the vision building, going to New York, seeing the Rockefeller Center. Thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if there's something like that here? So we had this vision of a complex integrated architecture plazas and fountains and so so funny uh, little a small world like our head offices are in are in bental three so yeah. so yeah, and we know it well w w when you I guys did a great job <laughs> well, thank you when i graduated from university that's where i got my first job went to went to work in the bental center so uh, i joined the family company right out of university and uh, like my dad and my grandpa, I was passionate about the real estate side of things. So I wanted to work in the real estate side. So I worked more or less for 10 years in the real estate side of the business. Part of my apprenticeship, I worked in Calgary for two years, worked in Toronto for a couple of years, worked in California, and joined the family firm. Ultimately, Benji, the, the tragic part of it is my uncles and my dad were ownership partners. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uncles, after my dad, on my dad's 50th anniversary with the company, decided they didn't want him anymore. Mm -hmm. Didn't want the company no more, didn't want me, mm -hmm. and they sold everything. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, uh, they decided to sell the construction business. My dad said, you can't do that. That's the company that granddad ran. That's the company that built everything. And my uncle said, well, this is business. Uh, we want out. We want out. So my dad said, well, can we buy the business? And so my sisters and I bought Dominion Construction. So that's how I ended up over time becoming president of the construction. When business. was that? What was 1988. That? Okay. And so I ended up being part of the leadership team for 10 years, 1988 to 1998 and ran that company. So you guys had this real, like you guys are a construction family, construction and real estate family. Yeah, yeah. You've got quite the empire. You've been building things up for decades in the late eighties. Uh, a set of uncles say, we want to liquidate. We want to go do other stuff. You guys decided we don't want to do that, and were you able to actually purchase it from the uncles and hold yeah, on? Yeah, we with? actually, for those who were tax minded, we did a butterfly of assets. So we actually acquired the construction company largely debt free, and my uncles got some buildings instead. So we actually, interesting, my, my sisters and I bought the business in 1980 and owned it together as partners for 10 years. You guys still own it? Is it still in the family? No, my, my brother-in-law came to me in 1998, 10 years later, and said, David, you're president and CEO of the business. You're 40% owner of the company. We've paid back all the debt. We, we did incur some debt. We paid back all the debt, bought out your brother. You, you're the only member of the family working in the company. Why don't you buy your sisters out? Mm -hmm. And so I made him a proposal to buy the business. Frankly, my heart wasn't really in it, Benji, because I was my passion was over on the real estate side. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at my offer and said, I think the company's worth more than that. And without going into all the details, he, he offered to buy the business for me. And I went home and said to my wife, I never wanted to be in construction in the first place. And so sold the business to my sister and my brother-in-law. Now this, um, this kind of story of the family and, and, and building all this up over the years is detailed in this book, Leaving a Legacy, but it has led you um, to do what you're doing now, which, which uh, next step advisor. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the mark that that family business had on you and how it led you to kind of operate in the succession planning family enterprise space that you, that you do today. The, the, the book's actually a funny story, Benji, because when I was getting some training to, to be as become an advisor, to work in families and business through the family firm Institute in the U S my mentor said to me, David, I'd like you to write an article just describing your transition from a family business executive to a family business advisor. So I opened my computer and I'm, as you know, I'm a competitive water skier. So every time I went to a tournament, I just opened my computer and worked on it a little bit. I ended up with a few words on a word document and I sent it to the editor for my first book. And I said, can you help me turn this into a little four page? A blog. No, I said, no, it was before blogs. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was ancient. I said, can you turn it into a four page brochure that I can pass, sure. off, pass on to people? And she read it over and said, David, you realize how much you've got. This is, you want four pages. You realize you have 120 pages. Uh, you've got a book. And I, I didn't realize that. I was just typing into the computer. So I ended up, Benji, chronicling my experience going from a family business executive to a family business advisor. And at the end of, when I finished the book, I read it over, okay, what do I learn? And basically the, the book is about all the mistakes we made, the 25 mistakes we made as a family. Those are my favorite kind of books. You did a nice job with that. It's learn, do, do, do don't do what, what I don't did. Don't do what <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. Do the opposite. Yeah. Um, 
So that that so it, but and what is Next Step Advisors today? Like what what are you guys exactly? Fundamentally, we are a firm that comes alongside families and business. You know, we didn't say next. You notice we didn't say Next Step Consultants. Yes, because consultants tell you what to do, and and consultants are valuable, obviously. But uh, we want we work with families, so we come alongside them and advise them, primarily Benji, as they're thinking about transitioning from one generation to the next. Okay, perfect segue. So many of our listeners would be owning, operating, building businesses that they are proud of, that uh, create opportunity for people in their community. It also creates opportunity for people within their family. And I think um, in the mind of many uh, of the people in our audience, they're thinking um, to some degree about how can I how can I keep this entity this business in the family I'd love to hand this off to a child or a few children maybe a nephew what have you what can you say about the success rate here when it comes to these handoffs these transitions what are, is, are there any statistics or any stories that might surprise people about uh, th- business entities moving from one generation to the next yeah, Benji, there's a lot of people who speak about statistics. And I, I took stats. I love stats. A lot of people don't like stats. Stats are very I helpful. Like so when, when, when I started learning more about this field, what was happening to our family, what our, and as I began to, to work uh, as an advisor to other families, I discovered that it was very common for people to say, first generation builds the company or starts the company, second generation builds it, third generation wrecks it. And they would quote stats and they say, you know, the transition from one generation to the next, people would often say, well, you know, only, only 30% make it from the first generation to the next, and then the third, second generation to the third, a smaller number, and then when you get to the third generation, second and the third, it's only 11%. And so if you look at the stats, actually, uh, the truth is that one-third of family companies transition successfully from one to the next. One-third of one of one third is 11%, which is the transition success rate from G2 to G3. So it's actually quite consistent. About one-third of family companies stay intact with the family from one generation to the next. So it doesn't get worse. Mm-hmm. It's actually quite consistent. But what's bogus about those stats, Benji, is if you and I started the company and built it and took it public and sold it for a gazillion dollars, that would be a, a negative in the stats because we no longer own the company. Right. Well, that's not a problem, right? Right. So there's, there's lots of noise in the stats. And so what, what I would like to emphasize for our listeners is that family companies do two things. People don't talk about these stats very often, except for John Davis for, taught family business studies at Harvard for 25 years. He talks about these things. He says family companies tend to last longer than non-family companies. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. But let's, start, let's talk about the data. The average lifespan of a company in the world is 12 years. Is it? The average lifespan of a family-owned company is 24 years. So it's almost, it's double. It's double. Yeah. Family companies, put it simply, family companies last twice as long as non-family companies. That's the first thing. I didn't know that. That's really and then the second thing John talks about, and there's tons of research on this, family companies tend to outperform non-family companies financially. So you take a tire manufacturing company that's family-owned and one that's not, the family-owned company will do better financially. So you ask why. There's a whole bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons that family companies tend to outperform their uh, counterparts is family companies invest for the long term. They're thinking, as you said earlier, about their kids or their grandkids. So family companies make long-term investment decisions. Can I illustrate that for yes, an example? Yes. So Cargill Grain's a family-owned company. Uh, years ago, when they, just when I was starting to learn about this field and getting my education, uh, I, we did, I read a research project about uh, the um, Cargill Grain Company. The, it, late 1980s, early 90s, they'd had a, a, the most successful year the company had ever had. What, did they, what would people do with that typically? They'd pay record dividends, right? Mm-hmm. Record earnings, record dividends. Instead, they reinvested 110% of their record earnings in their global expansion strategy. Family companies can do that, right? right. Public companies have to go, well, our shareholders want some of this, right? right? So that's why a, a company like Cargo Grain continues to prosper decades after its founding. So family companies invest for the long term. Number two, family companies do a better job of creating a unified culture. So it comes from dad and mom and their kids. But if you think about my dad and my grandpa, they created loyalty in, their, in the employees there, and they treated them much like family. 
when I taught at UBC undergrad and MBA classes, I had many of my students who were human resource specialists. I said, why are you taking this class? You're not in a family business. And they said, we want to know how to bring the familiness into non-family companies. So there's lots of other reasons, but those are a couple of the reasons. Those are the two big ones. They, they invest in the future more readily and they're able to build a unified culture. Or, or invest in their people more, yeah? So that all makes sense on paper, but I also, I also can think uh, of some of, the, some of the challenges involved. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could just speak broadly uh, about what is harder about doing business with your family members than just doing business with employees or colleagues or people you meet elsewhere. There's really unique traits about enterprises that are structured this way. So can you maybe just talk about some of the things that actually do make, I realize on there's some statistics that make it better, but what does, what, are, what so is there hard? Are, there, are yeah. real, there, there are genuine challenges. So, so the first thing is, you just think about it, my wife and I are gonna celebrate our 45th wedding anniversary this week. Right? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, it's been hard to get here, but we're, we're but why has it been hard to get here? Because marriage involves sharing. We have to share a kitchen and a budget and uh, a, tooth paper, a, a toothpaste tube, right? You have to learn to a share, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in a family enterprise, you've got the interpersonal dynamic. If, if you and I are in business and we're not brothers and we're not getting along, I either go work elsewhere or invite you to go work elsewhere or we sell the thing. But if we're family, we can't unbrother our. I mean... I guess you can, but you can choose to never talk to each other. But so you have this complication that you are family. So it, to, let's just use one word. It's more complicated because you have family and business to manage, two things to manage. Second way of looking at the same subject is it's more difficult, not just because it's more complicated. It's because you have different hats and they get mixed up. So let's just think about me working with my father. He was chairman of the board and a shareholder. And my dad, there's three roles, right? So whenever I was talking to him, I didn't know who I was talking to. It never occurred to me until I started getting some education about this. I actually was, I would talk to my dad. Right. If I had learned to talk to my dad as chairman of the board, it would have been radically different. Do you think I would yell at the chairman of the board? But I used to yell at my dad. I'd say, right. dad, what about us? What about us? Right. But if he was chairman, of the board, I would have been much more respectful. Right. It strikes me that the organizational chart becomes quite, um, well, it it's gets mixed complex, up because yeah. there's different hats, right? right. You, you, you get confused. If dad's talking to me, I'm looking at him. He looks like my dad. Right. I, for, I forget he's chairman of the board, right? And he looks at me and he sees me as his hope for the future rather than an employee. Right. Like we were getting really mixed up in our roles, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So it's, more, so it's more complicated and there's confused roles. And the third thing is, is there's more emotion. Yeah, I was right. going to ask about that. Like the There's more emotion, right? Tempers <laughs> you know, run a little hotter. Well, the, the passion and dedication is deeper and stronger, which helps for the, the success, but absolutely the, the emotions are stronger. Another way to think about it is that the, we all bring baggage from the past. You know, I've worked with families that I, I struggle to understand why they're not getting along, and I discover, well, somebody got the top bunk all the time. Right. And the, or someone stole somebody's bike, or somebody didn't forgive someone for whatever. They got mom and dad helped them more when they were in grade three. So it, there's stuff that's baggage. That, that doesn't happen in a company where you don't have family. So there's, it's more complex, different hats, and there's more emotion. Yeah, you're working with someone who on paper is your direct report or you're their direct report, but there's also this behind the scenes family drama and story that exists and you're still mad because yeah. you know, which what, is why fill in we, the blanks. Which is why you're not gonna talk about it uh, another day, but that's why forgiveness is relevant. Yeah. Like people go, David, you wrote in your second book about forgiveness. How does that relate? Stay tuned for next broadcast, yeah. but we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> But it's um, it is more uh, it is more challenging. It is more complex. The the tempers run a little bit hotter. In cases where businesses, where families who really want to transition their business to their kids, but then don't, they're like they the desire is there, but they do it unsuccessfully. What what happens in those instances? I'm sure there's a laundry list of things, but are there some patterns that emerge? Are you talking about what happens when they don't or why? Why? They, why, why? They don't? Yeah. So typically, there's two or three big ones. The first is, uh, and I was thinking about this in advance of our time together, the first is that the elder generation, I'm going to surprise you, I hope, and our listeners, the elder generation typically don't have high enough expectations of their kids. The, the, the 
the company actually becomes the employer of last resort. Like, you can't get a job elsewhere. I don't know what else. Come work with me, right? So let me give you an example on the positive side. So I interviewed Larry Rosen, not to be confused with Harry's. Larry, Larry is Harry's son. So most people who are listening would know of Harry Rosen's menswear. Larry went to work for his dad and became president and CEO of their family company. I talked to Larry and I said, Larry, do you want your boys, his three boys, I said, do you want your boys to work in the family firm? And he said, it's up to them. And I said, what do you mean? Notice he didn't say yes or no. He said, it's up to them. And I said, so what do you mean by that? And he said, before any of our boys can even consider coming to work for us, they need to get one degree, undergrad, whatever they want, MBA, and a minimum of five years experience before they show up at the door. Almost every family, and I've worked with hundreds of families in business, almost every family I've worked with have been reluctant to put any expectations on their kids. Why? Well, we didn't, I didn't have to do that, so why should I make my kids do that? And but my dad used to say to me, David, you could work here your whole life, and you'll still know, you still won't know everything there is to know, so come on board as soon as you can. We'll pay you more, we'll give you more opportunities. But uh, when I actually ended up against his advice, with his support ultimately, but went to work for the Cadillac Fairview Corporation at the time, they're the largest real estate co- private or largest public real estate company in North America, went to work for them. My dad said to me, you know, I was dead set against that. And I said, yeah, I, I knew that dad. And he said, best thing you ever did because I had a chance to learn what the real world is like, Benji. So you think that there is a lack of rigor or yes. toughness or discipline from, you call them G1, we should actually clarify El- that terminology. Elders, just talk the about el- elders. Like the, the parents that started the business are maybe a little too soft or not demanding they, their enough. Their expe- expectations aren't high enough. My first mentors were Philippe and Nanby the Gaspé Bobam from Montreal. And Philippe, uh, for those of the listeners who don't are familiar with him, made his money largely in telecommunications. But he, was, he ran Expo 67 in Montreal decades ago and kind of like the Jimmy Patterson of you know ran Expo 86 here in Vancouver and Philippe kept saying I expect more of my kids all of his kids went to Harvard all of them got M- Harvard MBAs but he kept saying I expect more I expect more I expect more and their mom PhD in psychology she kept saying you can do it you can do it you can do it there needs to be both and I think most families just we believe you can do it you can do it you can do it as opposed to we expect more we expect more i think the expectations are too low and larry rosen expected a lot of his kids and i've met a couple of them they've gone and got great education mm-hmm. got great experience now they're coming back and contributing is it just because they're their kids and they want to give them favorable treatment is it because they don't want to come off as a hard ass i mean probably why would both you extend pro- why would you be lenient about that you know like it's not it's actually not good for it's the, actually ignorance yeah they, they, i think most family business leaders are ignorant of the fact that they are ruining their kids by not expecting enough I'll give you an example not about business our uh, youngest daughter stephanie played on a soccer team first year they won every single soccer game yeah their coach was fun he was a rugby player not a soccer player so at practice they used to throw the ball around with their hands not kick it uh, he wasn't teaching skills. They were just having fun. They all loved him. They called him by his first name. John was great. The second year, they lost a third of their games. All the other teams were being disciplined, learning skills. Third year, they w- lost most of their games. Fourth year, the team folded. Yeah. Why? Were the kids inept? No. Nobody expected them to be disciplined. There's that saying, um, strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Weak men make bad times, bad times make strong men. Yes. And the cycle repeats. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to see if I can do this. Um, strong parents make rich families. Rich families make weak kids. Weak, fids, weak kids, kids, kids make, make weak, business. weak parents who make... Weak businesses. weak businesses who make poor kids. I'm botched, I've botched the cycle. Yeah, you get the good. idea. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's this thing where wealth will create... Um, can, can. can. Sorry, not... Can, not well can create softness softness you actually in one of your books you call it affluenza yeah, yeah so yeah. Uh, just just a quick aside any thoughts for parents who have been successful or are finding success and can see the next 10 years 20 years of their life while they're rearing children as being quite affluent you know that's going to happen but how do we keep the my three kids super hungry super motivated super disciplined read um 
Lee Hauser's book called Children of Paradise, uh, because she talks in that book, she was a, a, a counselor for the Beverly Hills School Board, so worked with some of the wealthiest of the wealthy who had more money than they knew what to do with. And she talked about how all of our children have four kinds of capital. They have financial capital. They may have very little, right? may have a piggy bank. They have financial capital. They have human capital. They have intellectual capital, and they have social capital. And she says most parents of wealth use their financial capital to be generous to their children, and they destroy their kids' ability to grow their own financial, intellectual, social, and human capital. And she says, what should we do with our money? We should use it to help the next generation begin to build their own financial capital, as well as their own intellectual, social, and human capital. So, you know, what does that mean? That means investing in their education as opposed to buying them cars. Mm -hmm. That means giving them opportunities to learn and grow rather than giving them opportunities to be pampered. Right? So it's a completely different mindset. I was chatting with a guy on Friday who took, took his company public, did really, really well in his business, and he noticed his kids were becoming affluent. You know what changed it? What? One of their children was born with autism. Interesting. Just like that. People had a sense to take a step back. So how, how do we do that? We can't ask everybody to adopt a, a child with special needs. But you know what we can do? We can take them to Mexico and have them help build a house. We, we, I've, had tw I've had the privilege of going 12 times now to Mexico. Can I just talk about the... 100%. We, we, took our we, we do those trips too here yeah. at BTA. So yeah. you're, you're so, preaching to the choir. So, so we took our son when yeah. he was 16. And our son, well, he, he's heard me talk about this. Our, our, our son, John, was pretty unhappy in his... High school, his three daughter, we had three daughters and a son. Went to Mexico to build a house. After, after building the house, uh, on the way home, we, we drive, we took our van. On our way home, we stopped at In-N-Out Burger for oh. some, something to eat. We, uh, have I, are, we so res good. are you resonating? Yeah. So our, our son, John, gets in the, we had a van with three rows of seats. My wife and I were in the front, our three daughters in the middle. Our son was in the back of the van, as far away from mom and dad as he could possibly be. And all of a sudden, from the back, after munching away on the burger for a minute, he said, you know what's wrong with this family, Dad? <laughs> I looked at my wife and I went, I don't know. <laughs> no, John, I, I, what, what's wrong with our family? He said, not enough gratitude. Thanks for the burger. And Benji, what I realized is it just took a, a few days in Mexico building a house mm. for a family that had less than we did, we did to help our son realize burgers don't grow on trees. I think we need to help our kids understand by exposing them to the fact that there are other people who have way less because it's too easy to look at, well, I only got a, I got, I got a one-year-old used Beamer rather than a, a new one. Like, that's, my friends all have new ones. Like, what's the deal? I find that, I find this whole topic really fascinating and I'd love to know more about the psychology and what's going on there because it's so, it's such a, um, like, it, it backfires. Like, one, yeah. there's a one generation or a, a, yeah. a dad or a mom who just works their ass off for 30 years or 50 years and they build something amazing and it ha it sort of soils so quickly. And I, I have friends, I've got family members, I, I have in my network and I can obviously can not see, name them, see them, but I can see mind. them yeah. in my mind where it's like, man, like, your dad was crazy successful. What are you doing? Not a ton. Well, Not yeah, a ton. it's funny. When our son, John, was getting married, I remember we went out for st to Starbucks the last night. He was living at home. And I said to him, I said, John, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I said, you know, you're getting married tomorrow. And I don't think I've done as good a job to prepare you for married life. Because, you know, mom and I have been married for quite a while. And it's, it's not it's not easy. And he said, Dad, don't worry. You've prepared me for life. And I'll be fine. And I said, what do you mean you've, I've prepared you for life? I had no idea what he was going to say. And he said, like how you dealt with money. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you would take us on holidays to Hawaii and you take us beautiful places. We'd have you know, lovely meals, wonderful resorts, wonderful time. And then we come home and I wanted to get a new uh, wakeboarding magazine or, and I'd have to pay for it myself. Like I, I didn't understand. And then when I went to university, I had to buy my own car. You, yeah. you were paying for university, but I had to buy my own car. My friends couldn't understand why you drove a Jag, right. and I had a 30-year-old Cougar with a piece of a rope tying the bumper on. And he said, Dad, you taught me 
that I need to become responsible for my own financial future, not depend on you. It's interesting. It's kind of two things. There's kind of two things shining through there. One is a level of restraint where it's like, mm -hmm. I could buy you the Jag. I'm just not going to, to, to teach you a lesson or to show you some discipline or to educate you on how the world works. And then the second thing is worldliness where it's like, let's go to Mexico. Let's yeah, go to yeah. Honduras. Let's go to Africa. Let's yeah, whatever. Yeah. So that you can see how, you know, 80% of the planet still functions. So I think I, those are, those are two really practical pieces of yeah, advice absolutely. around maybe cut, uh, you know, uh, can help avoid that can help, yeah, yeah exactly. can help avoid the absolute exactly. exactly. So, um, okay, back back to this question about like succession planning for parents who do want to pass on what they've built to their kids. What should they be proactively doing to set up that transition? Well, the, the, the first thing. Well, let, let's think about it now. Talk about the transition of wealth and transition of leadership. Let's talk about the two of them separately. Can we talk about leadership first? Let's talk about the two of them and make sure at the beginning here you, you explain why that distinction is important. So people talk about succession. You know, it's funny. I grew up in a real estate family. And people talk about, you know, there's three things you need to know about real estate. Location, location, right. location. And people say there's only one thing you need to know about in family business. Succession, succession, succession. Right. But, but Benji, when people talk about that, they often don't know what they're addressing or they're actually addressing two things that are, that are mixed up. Succession involves, amongst other things, two major components. One is who's going to own the businesses or the assets. That's an ownership succession. Number two, who is going to lead the company or family office? Who's going to be the executive mind behind managing things? Those are two completely different ideas. Let's say you and I are brothers. Our mom and dad might decide to give us equally 50% each of a business. Sure. They, you might have all the talent to run the company, so they let you run it. Those are two completely different ideas. Right. Leadership is one, ownership is another. So I think it's important to separate those. They get merged in people's heads I a can see lot. That. Yeah. They are really different ideas. Okay. So what do you do to set people up? Let's talk about leadership first. To set people up for leadership. So I'd like to quote Paul Demeray. Some of our listeners might not know of Paul Demeray, but Paul's family uh, owns a few things like... London Life, the investors group, Great West Life, Power Financial is the name of their company. Uh, Paul Demery asked him, I said, what do you want to do for your kids to help them? His father started the company and Paul and his brother Andre were co-CEOs of their business. And I said, Paul, what do you want to do for your kids to help them become capable to lead one day? And I'll never forget, and I, he gave me permission to share this publicly. He said, David, I want our children to go as far away as they possibly can and be so successful elsewhere that we will beg them to return. Interesting. You, you notice that's not pampering. Not at that's, all. What does an eagle do to teach a, uh, uh, kicks an eagle? It, it kicks nest. it out of the net. Yeah. And Paul said, they're not allowed here. Just like Larry Rosen. You notice this common theme, hey? Go elsewhere and learn. Go, go elsewhere. S be so successful that we will beg you to return. I was giving these remarks to, uh, at a conference here in Vancouver one day, and a, and a gal put up her hand at the end, and she said, um, what if our children, what, she was talking about her son in particular, she said, what if my son goes elsewhere and he becomes really successful working for some other company, and he's in a completely different industry, and he's passionate about that and loving it, and he never wants to come back? Mm -hmm. And I said, that would be fantastic. She said, no, that'd be tragic. And I said, bring on the tragedy, right? Like, wouldn't that be wonderful if he was passionate and successful and self-fulfilled and self-reliant? It's a pretty good problem to have. Most, most people aren't prepared to risk that kind right. of tragedy. Right. I, I think that's the, the number one thing. And you know, frankly, I remember a, a student from Spain came and we were talking a bit. He's, they were in the automotive uh, retailing business. They had six or seven dealerships and he was taking his MBA at UBC and he said to me one day over coffee, he said, you know, my uncle wants me to join the family firm. I, I hear you talking about the reasons why I should work elsewhere. Uh, why should I go work elsewhere? Mm. And I, it, it took us four minutes and we had 12 reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them is that, I'll give you three. Uh, one of them is that if you look in the mirror in the morning, you'll actually realize you're competent as opposed to being dependent. Totally. That, you can't buy that. No. N number two, the other people in the company that work with you will recognize you're competent because you actually earned your spurs elsewhere. Number three, other members of the family will respect you because you've sh shown and proven you're capable. Uh, we gotta, it That's going to be a hugely important part, the respect of the other people. Thing family, and yeah. family and yeah. non -family. Absolutely. Yeah. It, if it doesn't pass, if it's not passing the mirror test for you, 
it's definitely not for everyone else in the organization. Yeah. Any any other points you'd make about like just the and we're talking about the the leadership side here yeah. first. Anything else that that parents yes. can yeah. do proactively to set yeah. their kids up well? Yeah, I, I, I love to talk about this. Uh, the, the idea that I think parents should invite their children to consider is an apprenticeship mentality. Okay. And so the parents need to think about it, communicate it, and help the kids to take an apprenticeship mentality. So let's talk about, let's talk about, you know, I'm in construction. So if you want to become a, a carpenter or a, an electrician, you need to go through an apprenticeship. You need to qualify for your trade. If you want to be a lawyer or an accountant, you need to do your articles in order to be invited into the profession. You want to be a professional engineer, you need to... Uh, most professions, we go through an apprenticeship mentality. But in family business, all you have to do is have the right last name. Like, what, what are we thinking? And what, what I want to suggest to our listeners is, if you're the elder generation or the younger generation, let's talk about what an apprenticeship looks like. Because just because you're born into the family does not mean you are ready to become a leader. It means that you, you you have the opportunity to become an apprentice. What, what, and so what does that practically look like inside a business? Like I, I, that is a great soundbite, and I, it totally makes sense intuitively, but are there some steps beneath that that you would advise? Well, yeah, uh, three. Step one, out of the nest, go get an education. Yeah. Step two, out of the nest, get work experience elsewhere. Yeah. Step three, when you join the company, you're there to learn rather than to rule. Right. Right? Most people miss all three steps. They say, I'm, I'm a bental, I should lead. Right. But that, that's, that's how I joined our family company. I thought everybody should be listening to me because I'm the son of the chairman, son of the founder. It's really interesting how that like, entitlement happens. That, and and that by the way, I, I mean, people might have had a different perspective of me, but I, actually, I was willing to work hard yeah. and I wanted to make a contribution. I was completely blind to the fact that I had this wrong-headed perspective, partly because I don't want to blame my dad, but partly because my dad said, you know, you're the only member of the next generation working in the family company. We want you to lead it one mm-hmm. day. Or he even told me one day, you know, we named you David. David was the king of Israel. We want you to lead. Like he actually said those words, right? Lovely, lovely in, at one level, right? His, he, Beautiful his sentiment. Belie- yeah. his, his belief in me. Yeah. I wish he'd said, go away <laughs> and prove you've got something to offer, right? So what about, what about the ownership? We talked a little bit yeah. about maybe proactive stuff for setting up leadership side. Talk about the other side of this coin too. Okay, so the first thing, let's, let's talk about people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Okay, big w- names. Yeah, what have they decided? They've decided that their wealth doesn't belong to all of their kids, right? I don't know what Bill Gates has said lately, but years ago he said no one needs more than $10 million. right. Right now, so I, I'm sure his kids probably, if they heard that, didn't like that because there's billions, but nobody needs more than 10 million. So the first question that I think the elder generation needs to ask themselves is, how much do we want to give our kids? Warren Buffett has said, I want to give like virtually, I want yeah. to give virtually everything yeah. to charity. That's a much wiser choice than wrecking your kids by giving everything to the kids. So I think the first question the elder generation needs to ask is how much do we want to give back to the community or to charity right because too often it's just the the legal or accounting and by the way i'm a fan of legal and accounting advice but often the legal and accounting advice is what's the most tax effective way of passing everything to your kids that that's totally legit but someone should be asking the question before that which is how much do we want to leave to the kids so that, that's, that's like a number that they come up with. But where does the entity that is the business kind of fit in that estate planning and that kind of like where, where does the actual business organism sit in there? It's a low priority in my, in my mind. You know, if, if we think about it, you know, so do we have a trust or do we have, have a corporation or do we go public? All those things are details. Let's start with what really matters. Right. What do we want to do with this money? Let, let, let's imagine, snap our fingers and our listeners, all of them become billionaires. Are, are, I'm guessing that no one has told them the first question you should ask is how much do you want to give away rather than just assuming it's all going to go to your kids? Nope. If Bill Gates is half right, nobody needs more than $10 million, then we've got a lot to spare, Right. I'll put you on the spot here. You've you've got you've got a a big body of work on this. What's the right, like, is there a right number? I'm sure it's different from family to family, but is there like a sweet spot where you're thinking about yeah, you know what this 
will keep them intact psychologically and spiritually, this will probably mess them up. Well, I don't think there's a right number because there are young people, young adults who can be good stewards of wealth. There are some who wealth will ruin them. So it's very, uh, very situational. But the one thing I would say, I actually spent some time with a group of uh, legal and accounting and banking professionals talking about the $10 million number. We had some fun with the $10 million number because if you have $10 million, when you're a child, let's, let's, let's say you invest the $10 million and you invest it at 5% after tax, 2.5%. So you go, what have you got? you got 250000 bucks a year, right? So you've got 250000 and you're a toddler. That'll buy you all of, the di- all of the diapers and toys you need you're as good. a toddler, right? Mm-hmm. In your teens, two hundred fifty grand. that's going to buy you all of the, the movies you're you want to go rich. to yeah. all the time you want to skate with. So that, that's going to be fine. When you get into, into, into university... Even if you want to go to the most, one of the most expensive universities in the United States, that'll pay for your university. Yeah, you're a one percenter from birth, basically. Yeah, and and then in your if you decide you don't want to work, two hundred fifty thousand dollars is going to look after you for the rest. I mean, you can spend more, but two hundred fifty thousand after tax will provide for most folks. Now, oh, but what about a house? Well, okay, you take a little bit from here and there. Some of the diapers you didn't buy, you know, we we can save up to buy a house. So my view is that Bill Gates was actually pretty close to right that no one needs more than 10. So I would put, I would flip it the other way, Benji, and I'd say, tell me why you want to give your kids more than 10 million. Yeah. What's the reason for doing that? I like that. It's a good upper threshold. Here's a really common situation going back to parents and offsprings in business. Okay. You've got a, um, you've got a, set of parents, let's just say a dad who's, uh, and dad's name is Dave and Dave has, you know, run the business for 15, 20 years, 30 years, even, um, good business, solid, uh, sound financials, good team in place. But then you've got, you know, the son who has a different vision. He's like excited. He embraces, uh, modern branding concepts. He's a little more into technology and software. Um, he's got a whole host of ideas about how this business, which again is very good, very sound, could go to the stratosphere, could become Take it to the next level. Yeah. He's got all these ideas and he's excited and he's got that sort of like young man's thing going where he's fiercely believes that he's going to take over the world and, you know, be the Bill Gates of HVAC, whatever. Yeah. You know this scenario. Like it's a very archetypal situation. Uh, I've, I've met I've met him. Yeah. So I've the met dad. Son. So there's there's two sides to this story. Uh, we talked a little bit about what the parents should be thinking about and could be thinking about. Here's my question. What advice do you have for that son? Let's say his name's Tim. What what do you tell p- those kids in these businesses who have a vision for the future but are maybe at times impatient? I've met Tim. What I told Tim was, no surprise, go and work elsewhere until your parents beg you to come back. Yeah. Because if you are as, and I remember saying to, I can, t- I can see the person in the boardroom in Calgary, and I remember saying to him, if you think you are as good as you think you are, sorry, if you are as good as you think you are, go prove it. Mm-hmm. And he said, but I want to work with that. I said, I know you want to work with that, but you say that you are better than dad. Go prove that elsewhere. Right. And so he didn't take my advice, went to work with dad, and they spent the last 15 years arguing because he wants to take over and his dad's not been willing to give him the leadership. Are there any um, major like best practices that that really do make a difference for this? Mm. We were talking offline and I was like, what about this? What about this? And you're like, yeah, not, like a lot of that is a huge waste of time. I think you're talking about. We're talking about written succession plans. We're like, yeah, it does right. nothing. So what what are the what are the really material, the really substantial best practices, habits, systems that a family could put in place that makes transition a lot easier? Great. Well, we did talk about that offline. And it came what we were talking about was a study that was done with eighteen thousand families in the United States. So it was a, a ten year study. 18,000 family-owned businesses and Kennesaw State University funded by Mass Mutual studied, would it make a difference if they had a written succession plan in order for them to transition from one generation to the next? They hoped to prove that that would be a good idea. And they were shocked to find out you can have a written succession plan and you can have a mess or you can have a written succession plan and a smooth transition. No Makes correlation. No, no correlation whatsoever. Interesting. But uh, they did some regression analysis, went back and looked at the data. There must be something in here that we can learn. 
and they discovered uh, there's three things that actually do make a difference. Statistically, it's been shown that if families do three things, they can statistically enhance their, their prospects for making a smooth transition. The first is have regular family meetings. So why, why is that? Regular family meetings enable families to start communicating. Tim and Dave start talking about the vision for the future. They, they have a chance to talk stuff through. What's the agenda of these family meetings? How often do they happen? Each family can be different. My wife and I started having family meetings when our kids were six and four and two. And we started in our first family meetings just about charitable giving. That's all we did. Then later on it became chores and then became, uh, you know, plans for university and how do you earn your first car if you graduate from university we'll give you some money for your first car so we you know it can, it can include all kinds of things but the wisest families uh, start uh, including somewhere along the way thinking about how do we communicate because tim and dave back to your example tim and dave le- need to learn to listen to each other the elder generation needs to listen dave's got some good ideas right Tim needs to listen to dad because it's dad's company. Totally. So learning to communicate is one of the things that ought to be there. Uh, learn how to make decisions together. So where do we start? Well, let's start, let's start with thinking about where we're going to go on vacation together. Or let's start with thinking about what we're going to give to charitably. Or let's, let's start talking and make decisions together about how as a family we handle the chores around the house. Who gets to take out the garbage and who gets to mow the grass? As a family, you can start with just mundane little things like that. And families, the, the wisest families, you asked how, how often? Yeah. If you have them once a year, that's not a family meeting. That's a family reunion. Right. <laughs> so it needs to be at least a couple times a year. Uh, ideally, families will meet uh, more frequently than twice a year. But I remember one family, uh, they didn't have a family enterprise or family business, but they used to meet every Sunday night yeah. just to talk about stuff. Interesting. So this th- this is like semi structured. There's some structured. there's some structured. cadence to structured. it. Structured. Yeah. Structured. Quarterly to start. You could probably do more often. Yeah. And I say and I say structured. One of my mentors, one of my colleagues, says that formality is our friend, and most of us it's family. We don't want it to be formal. And I remember after you know we started with our daughter when she was our eldest daughter when she was six. And when she was 26, we were having our 20th family meeting because we started just doing them once a year because uh, I hadn't learned what I've learned <laughs> since. And she, uh, she said to me, I finally figured out why we do these meetings. And I said, why do you think we do these meetings? She said, they're for us. Right. And I said, yes, they are. And she said, why, I said, why, why, why did you, f- what, what gave you the clue that they're for you? She said, well, we're talking about how you're helping us set up our tax-free savings account. You're helping us set up our RESP. You're helping us plan for our university. You're helping us with money set aside for our first house. You are trying to help us get a good start in life. And I said, 100%, sweetheart. Why did, what, why did, you, what did you think the meetings were for? Right. And she said, well, you know, some people play doctor. Some people play house. I thought we were playing business with you. Right. <laughs> she right. just thought they were humoring dad to play this game called business with dad. Took a while for her to get took, it, but she did a, eventually. She got it. What's the second thing uh, besides like regular family meetings? Uh, the uh, the same the same research we were talking about the eighteen thousand families. Yeah. They discovered that if you have a board of directors with independent members, you have a, a radically improved opportunity to or in, uh, prospects of succeeding for one generation. A board of directors sounds like a very big business thing. It sounds kind of white collar. It sounds sort of corporate. Like, could you do this for a $5 million roofing business? Absolutely, positively. Okay, so so who goes on it? What does it look like? What's the, what what is it? What role does it serve? Let's talk about size for a moment. John John Ward, who 25 years ago wrote the seminal work about creating effective boards for private enterprise. And he's now published a new book called Creating Effective Boards for, for Family Business. Both books talks about how if you got 50 employees, you're complicated enough to warrant having a family, or a board of directors with independent members. And I think I told you offline that you know, I have a friend who had a company of one. Mm-hmm. And he said, I don't have a big enough company to have a board of directors, so I'm going to have a board of advisors. And he, and he got together with three guys uh, regularly to mentor him. Now he's established a multi-billion dollar company. I actually think there's a correlation between those two things. He was willing to take an apprenticeship mentality and learn. I think these other men poured into his life and helped him to, to do that. But for a small business, like what, what is the purpose of a board of directors? Like what is it, what is it there to do? Help you make hard decisions, advise on strategy. So I can give you a four-day course on it because I teach governance, okay? But so, so you probably don't want the four-day version. So a board of directors fundamentally, in a, let's talk about the, the $5 million roofing company. 
the, the board of directors can help the owners of the family business do several things. The first is to ensure that they're taking the long-term view, which we talked about. That, that's the advantage of a family enterprise. But let's make sure they take a long-term view. Many family companies harvest their wealth from the business rather than reinvest adequately. So one thing that family, a board can help balance that. How much do we take out? How much do we invest? So that's one. Number two, they can help with strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, they can help thirdly with the, remember we talked about the emotions with the kids? They can totally. help with, we can help with, with Tim and Dave. Help, help. Because help. it's like a third party. It's like a. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes Dave is actually right that we should do something different online to help the, grow the roofing company. Sometimes dad is right that actually the reason we've been successful is because we do it this way and his, his son needs to recognize we're going to keep doing it this way. So the board can help with those relationships. So there's a lot of things that a, a board can do. How many, pe like how many people constitute a board, let's say, for this $5 million business? And where should we find them? Well, uh, two, two separate questions. But the, the, how many? You, you want to have at least three independent non-family participants. And you, you can have some family members included if you wish, but you want to start by having three independent non-families. One, if you just have one person, that's like having a second CEO, so that's not very helpful. Two, you, you begin to have a brain trust, but by the time you get three, you've actually got a, a robust enough group of people that can help you serve as a sounding board, assist you with your planning. And then you're asking, what, what else did you ask about... Oh, I was just wondering, how, like, how many make up a board, and then where where should we well, where be? Should like, we, where should we find them? them? What kind of people are we yeah, looking for? So, most be I've helped over two dozen families to do this, and they all want to start with their friends or their family. Yeah. You've already got their advice for free. I say don't don't pay advice to your friends and family, and then they say, well, how about my lawyer or my accountant, banker? You already have their advice, and you're already paying them in another way. So you want to. You want to step past all of those who are closest to you and find people who can help you strategically. So can I illustrate that? So let's say you're at a business and you're planning to franchise it. Okay, how are we going to do that? Let's have someone on the board who's done franchising, not to do it for us, but to guide us. Or let's say that if you're uh, in a construction company and you're planning to expand geographically, well, have someone on your board who's actually in that geography so they can help network you in that geography, right? Are these people like always people in your network or are no. you occasionally like literally just picking no. up the phone and dialing and well, like it's a stranger? Well, you've, you've heard, Benji, about the, the six degrees of separation. You know somebody who knows someone who knows the King of England, right? So uh, frankly, I actually knew somebody who... Uh, knew the Queen of England, so I mean it's it's, it's actually closer than you think. The right? access is easier. The access than you is easier than you think. Yeah. And and what as I've had the privilege of helping families uh, recruit new board members or independent board members, we go to the people that they know and trust and ask them who they know who would fit. So go to your lawyer, go to your accountant, go to your banker, go to your best friend, go to family, and say who would you recommend? Right. Here's what we're looking for. Right. Okay. So that that's practical advice. You it, you don't need to know them. You don't need. They don't need to be friends. You don't, you don't need to. You, frankly, you don't want them because if they're if you're friends, they may not actually speak the truth. You want to them you. a little bit more objective. What was the third thing from this study that mm. that really made a big difference? So regular family meetings, board of directors with independent members, and the third thing might surprise you: some form of strategic planning process. And I think for our listeners, this is going to be particularly helpful because many of our uh, construction folk are like my dad or my grandpa, entrepreneurial and opportunistic. And so strategic planning is, my dad didn't like the idea of strategic right. planning. But if we, f if we put together some form of strategy, and uh, you notice how the, the research is pretty vague, some form, it doesn't have to be a particular form of strategic planning, but no matter what form we use, a formalized strategic planning process requires the shareholders, the family, the management all to get on the same page and say we're going left or right. Mm -hmm. So back to expansion. Are we going to expand and move into a different geography or mm -hmm. to a different product line? Or are we going to market in a different way? Or are we going to hire different people? We've had many strategic planning uh, conversations on this episode. We are, you know, big proponents of it. Yeah, Certainly yeah. within Breakthrough Academy, a lot of our listeners would have downloaded our, you know, we have a little process yeah. that we think is really great awesome. for, for a small awesome. business. But so I think, I think like for the most part, we're sold on the idea of street strategic planning because of what it does for our business and its success yes, and our yes. decision making. What's the connection to the family part and why is it important in this context? Well, in let's particular? go back to, to Dave and Tim. 
let's say Dave and Tim have a completely different vision for the future. Mm. The strategic planning process allows that to be somewhat talk, synthesized. talk through and create alignment. Yeah. Or you discover through the strategic planning process that we don't belong in the same corporation because we've got completely different ideas, right? Which so, happens sometimes too. Which is not the end of the world, right? Yeah. Interesting. So it, it, I don't like using the word force, but the strategic planning process forces alignment or forces people to choose to go different ways. You know, my brother and I are 12 and a half years apart in age. And when we had the opportunity to buy the construction business, my brother chose not to join with us. So my sister Mary, my sister Helen and I became partners. I think part of the reason was that my brother had different vision for his life. He didn't want to be involved in the, he was an architect by training. He didn't want to be involved in the construction business. It's a completely legitimate choice. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't even get to the strategic planning. We, we just got to the, do we buy the business or not? But if we got into a strategic planning, that might have helped us to figure out, do we belong in the same corporation or not? So these three things you think make a much bigger difference than some written succession plan or something else? I'm not against <clears throat> succession plans, but statistically, that makes no difference. What about resolving conflicts? Like business is just naturally quite the pressure cooker and there's all, there are going to be periods of time where things aren't going well. There's going to be periods of time where there's transition and turnover. Uh, there's going to be difficult clients. Like there's just going to be sections of the journey where it's not that peachy. Um, and, and, and in certain intense moments, you'll have, you know, family members really quite pitted against each other. What have you seen be effective uh, as a means of ameliorating that conflict, the infighting when it does naturally occur? What, what works for families? Okay, so two doors. The first is how do we avoid it be becoming bad? And then Which how is do, sort of the stuff we mentioned. And I how think do that's we fix it? Preemptive well, a little. That, that re it's preventative stuff, right? Yeah. So it, 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 a board of directors doesn't sound like it's going to prevent conflict. But can I just use a specific example? When I was at our family firm, I heard I, I wanted to take an MBA, but I didn't want to leave the business to go do that. And I found out that the, that Harvard owned a, uh, offered a program called the Owner Presidents Program, and at the time, 1990, it was a thirty thousand dollar program. So I talked to our chairman of the board, I was president, talked to our chairman of the board, non-family member, Dick Myers. He used to run Dillingham of Canada. And I said, Dick, I'd like to take this program. He said, it's fantastic. It's three weeks intensive each year for three years. It's 30 grand. Mm. Let, why don't you do that? So we took it to the, our board of directors. We had on the board uh, two independent non-family members and my dad and my, and my brother-in-law and Mr. Myers and my sister Helen. So there was uh, six folks on the board. And I remember taking the, this idea to the board and my sister harumphed, she's, 12, she's 15 years older than me, Helen, and she said, no way, no how am I paying for some boondoggle for my little baby brother. Right. And Mr. Meyer said, well, oh, this is not a boondoggle. This is a professional program at Harvard. She said, I don't care. I changed my little baby brother's diapers and I'm not paying for him to go to this program. And you know, everybody's looking, like, what has it got to do with diapers? But anyway, there we go. And so Mr. Meyer's quite wise. He said, let's just table that. So at the coffee break, I overheard them chatting. And uh, Mr. Myers said to her, Helen, can we talk about it? She said, you could talk about it all you like, but he's not gone. And she said, well, can, can I just talk? You could talk all you like, but I, he's not gone. And Mr. Myers said, can I just invite you to look at it a different way? This is dealing with conflict and how a board can be super helpful. So he said, so the, uh, I, I've explained it's a $30,000 program, but a better way to think about it is it's actually a $10,000 program. It's $10,000 each year. Of course, it's three years, but it's $10,000 a year. It's not $30,000. It's $10,000 per year. It's a business expense. Secondly, you're a, Helen, you're a 20% owner of the company. Right. So you're... It's two you, grand. It's two grand a year. Yeah. And it's a, t it's a company expense, so it's actually after tax, $1,000. And he said, what I'd like you to think about, what do you think about, rather than an expense, what about a $1,000 investment? each year for the next three years in your brother's education so that he can do a better job in looking after the millions of dollars that you've got invested in this business. She said, well, why didn't you explain it that way in the first place? Of course he can go. Right. No, no. So no, notice objectivity, right? And, and the ability to talk in a non-emotional way with my sister and help. Now, I, I like that story because I got to go to Harvard. But the point is my sister and I avoided having a major blow up. Can you imagine what would have happened if I had gone, 
And she'd been unhappy for the yeah, rest of her. Yeah, be super nasty. Or what happened if she'd blocked me going and I couldn't go because of my sister? Like it just, but an independent board can help with that kind of stuff. But what about if we have this stuff in place and, 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 and tempers still flare? I mean, like we can do all the right things and there's still going to be sections where it's just, we're not seeing eye to eye. I, I, I got two or three things. So, so the first is, uh, I mentioned the, the Gaspé Bobian family being my mentors. They, inv- they recommend families have a, 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 a council, a family council that has embedded in that a conflict resolution committee. Two or three mentors who everybody agrees ahead of time, if we get into trouble, hmm. we're going to them. Interesting. So you, you can actually, you don't need to go to the courts. You can say, we trust Joe and Mary and Bill. If we get into trouble, we're going to go to Joe and Mary and Bill and they're going to help us sort. So you can have your own private tribunal, if you wish. So that's one idea. Uh, and another idea, back to the fa- regular family meetings. Talk about the family meeting, uh, talk about stuff in the context of the family early on so you can resolve it be- when it's small rather than when it becomes big. But if it becomes big, uh, two things I want to suggest which are, have legal implications. One, my sisters and my brother and I co-own 26 acres on an island. And we went to our lawyer and we said, we don't want to have a, a lawsuit if we don't agree. God willing, there'll be four homes there. One day there's two homes there now. And a t- two homes and a tennis court and a dock. So what we put in our shareholders agreement is, <laughs> in polite language, we will not sue each other. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, but what if we don't agree? So we wrote in that, number one, if we don't agree, we'll talk. If we still can't agree, we will write a letter saying we want to negotiate something different than we've got over the next 60 days. Right. I'm putting on notice, Benji, if we don't get an agreement on 60 days, I'm going to go to step three, which is we're going to go to mediation. Mm-hmm. And if we don't get an agreement within a specified period of time on mediation, then we're going to go to binding arbitration. So we actually had a process set up. And as a family, we used that once. My, uh, when you disagreed on something. Yeah, my siblings disagreed. Yeah. Some trees got cut down and somebody was unhappy about what happened. And so rather than having a lawsuit... We, ha- we had a negotiation, didn't get us very far. So we were on the verge of mediation and we, we estimated what it would cost to do mediation. And the cost of mediation was going to be maybe 80 grand. And so one of the parties, I said, to, one, I was not a party to the dispute. So I said to the, one of my siblings, I said, instead of paying 40,000 for half of a mediation, why don't you offer 40,000 to settle this? And that person offered 40, and the other person said, how about 50? And it was settled. <laughs> so it, the point is, you know, you can do stuff that, that uh, sometimes things have to go to court, but as a family, you don't want to fight each other in court, so why don't we find mechanisms that will avoid that? And now our family, you know, for a few years, we couldn't get together for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Now we can because we were able to work that through, and both of my siblings had to forgive each other. This is over the trees? This is over the trees. No Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Because of the trees. Well, some trees got cut down, so it was... What's the island? Keats Island. Okay, cool. So I want to talk about one other idea. Yeah. Most family companies, well, I'll say that differently. I think most uh, partnerships in Canada have uh, of a shareholders agreement. And in that, they will often have, most of them would have, I think, a, a shotgun clause. Our listeners would probably be familiar with mm-hmm. the shotgun clause. But for those who aren't, I'm just going to describe it in two seconds. Or two minutes, less than two, more than two seconds, less than two minutes. Uh, a shotgun clause is essentially a way of dividing, uh, assuming your two, two partners are 50 50. So let's think about it in terms of two young children who go out in the backyard and mom says, Here's a big piece of cake. I want you to share it. They give one of the kids a knife and the kid cuts the cake in half. The other one gets to decide which piece of cake they get. Yeah. So, Benji, uh, skill testing question. What will that child who has the knife do? Right down the middle. Right down. Why? Because he's giving the power to the other sibling. After he doesn't know which he yeah, doesn't know exactly. which piece he's going to get. So it makes even a nasty kid fair-minded. Yeah. Yeah. So shotgun clause is the same. If you and I are partners, we have a shotgun clause in our shareholders agreement that says if you and I are done with each other, one of us can pull the shotgun, pull the trigger, and say we're done. And in order to do that, you need to name the price at which you think the company. Which you sorry, name the price at which you'd either be a buyer or seller. So say the company's worth ten million bucks, and you say I'm prepared to buy you or sell at five million bucks. The right. other party has the choice to buy or sell. I think it's a great, great mechanism. Smart. It encourages even mean people to be nice. Yeah. To play nice. It it gets it's it gets a resolution. Yeah. It it, it, it encourages fairness. It gets a speedy resolution, and it's usually a, a fair uh, result. The problem is. 
often two or three problems, actually. One problem is people stay in partnerships because they're afraid of the shotgun clause because they don't want to be blown out of the water. Sure. So we have bad people, sorry, bad partnerships staying together because they're afraid. They don't know whether they're going to be bought or sold. So that's one. Two is often you end up with someone being bought out who's the natural leader or the one who should be owning the company. They're so fed up with the other partner. They end up being bought out, so you end up with the wrong person buying. And then the third thing is it destroys relationships. For so, sure. so it's not a good idea. So how can we improve on that? So we went to our legal advisor, Bill Miles, for, uh, now Bordner Ladner Gervais, BLG. We went to him, Bill. We said, Bill, we, don't, we recognize the shotgun clause is helpful, but we don't want to have that. And so he came up with something similar enough to have all the benefits, but different enough, I think, to make it radically better. He said, why don't you put a private auction in place? So imagine again, you and I are in partnership. I think I've proposed that four or five times today. So imagine we're in partnership together and you are fed up with me, you want this done. Instead of naming a price at which you're a buyer or seller, you name a price, if you want to trigger the auction, you name a price at which you are prepared to buy me out. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that, I love using this illustration, let's imagine that you decide you want to go to move to Australia. Sure. Totally legit. It's, nice place. it's not that we're not getting along. Yeah. You just want to go to Australia. Yeah. And we own this company together. So you say, David, I want to go to Australia. And so, we, but we'd have trouble agreeing on a price. So we go to our shotgun or our auction clause and you offer me a price. If you want to go to Australia and you want me to buy you out and the company's, you think the company's worth 10 million, what are you going to offer to buy my half for? Five. No. Because I might accept that. What are you going to offer? You're going to offer a little bit less. Four. Well, m maybe not that low, but something less. So you induce me to buy you. Go, heck, four million bucks, I'll buy you out. I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. Wh whatever. The, so let's say you'll say four, nine. Like, okay. And I go four, nine. What happens if I, if I say four, nine, I buy you out? Mm -hmm. You give slight, slight discount in order to go to Australia. You're That's willing to do that. Right? Or if I say four, nine, uh, I will, uh, uh, you offer to buy me out, I, I sell it to you. Mm -hmm. And you go, huh, I didn't want the company, but four and I match less so I can turn around and sell it because I bought it, but the other half. For it. So the idea is that it builds in an auction. It, and when my sisters and I were partners, that's what we put in our shareholder agreement. And what that meant for me as the president and CEO of the company, I knew every day mm -hmm. I could put my head on my pillow and know for the rest of my life, I would be in this company and an owner unless my sisters offered me a price at which I was happy mm -hmm. to sell. Mm -hmm. And they knew conversely that they could get rid of me any day of the week unless I was prepared to offer them a fair price. And so we actually ended up using that 10 years after. My brother-in-law came to me and said, David, I, uh, you've, you've offered to buy the company as I asked you to. I think the company's worth more. So he said, let's use the auction. So he offered a price. And I looked at that and went and said to my wife, I said, I've now got a full price offer yeah. for a minority interest in an industry I never wanted to be in. And I, rather than bidding up in, through the auction, I said, happy to sell. Yeah. Yeah, th th those these these frameworks, these rules, these procedures, these documents that you put in place, you, you really don't need them until you do, and then you and then you really do. And it's it's there's been a number. Uh, I know a number of BTA members who have exercised the shotgun clause quite successfully for the exact reasons that you just outlined. Yeah. They're in partnerships that aren't working. And, they, and for our listeners, they would lose nothing if they had the auction process. Right. It would it potential to keep the relationships together even more intact. So if anybody's interested, happy to have them email. I can get them copies of those two documents can you maybe speak to uh, and this is a good place to end it like the 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 upside here like what what is you know i guess to put it simply like is it worth it like like doing doing business with your family doing this over the long term 100 span of decades speak to why why would you make the case for it so uh, we started near the top of the show talking about the fact my wife and i are celebrating our 45th anniversary mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just start with a quick story. There was a gentleman who celebrated his 80th anniversary recently. Wow. And somebody said to me, he was an octog... Sorry, 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 sorry. He was 80. He was 60th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So he's celebrating his 60th anniversary. He was an octogenarian. He was 80-something. And some uh, people said to him, so what's the key to being married 60 years? And he said, uh, not giving up in the first 20. And everyone, ha, ha, funny, funny. He said, no, no, I'm serious. And they said, well, what do you mean you're serious? And he said, in the first 20 years, you have your first job, your first house, your first mortgage, all of the challenges that come with uh, adjusting to being married in the first 20 years. He said, if you can get through that, 
it's smooth sailing after that. So for my, for my wife and I, it was the first 22. <laughs> we found the first 22 kind of, kind of challenging. So now, now it's, it, it's easier. And so, you know, the reason I relate this to marriage is marriage is not easy. Mm-hmm. We all know that. The, the divorce rate's 50%. So we say, divorce rate's 50%, so why should anybody bother get married? It's actually a wonderful institution, but it takes work. And I think a family enterprise is the same. It's a wonderful institution. Businesses last twice as long. They earn more money. It's worth the effort, mm-hmm. but it ain't easy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So th- this, um, you would make the case that over the long haul, this is better for the family, not just the business. And 85% of all companies in the world are family businesses. It's the backbone, backbone of the economy in Canada, the backbone of the right. economy of the world. Right. It's, it's, it's the best form of business. It's just not perfect. Yeah. And it's got challenges. Yeah. It, that's interesting. It, this is how the world functions, I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's funny, half but, or more than half of the businesses on the planet. Are no, 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 no. It's, it's way more than half. What like, is it? What's well, the stat? Well, so if you look at all the countries, it's different by country, but a rough average is over 85% of all wow. companies in the world. Our and I remember businesses. talking, yeah, I remember talking about this to my MBA class and uh, the next day, one of the students came in and she put up her hand and was mad at me. She said, Professor Bentall, you said yesterday that all around the world, approximately 85% of all companies are, fa- or, uh, all companies uh, are, are family business. And she said, you're wrong. I'm from India. In India, it's over 96%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 96%. So it, it is the vast majority of companies in the world are family, family enterprise. So we, want, we need to help families learn how to manage the challenges because it's worth it. So interesting. Where can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about Next Step Advisors? D- please go to my website, nextstepadvisors.ca and just be in we'll touch. We'll link it. We'll link it below Brilliant. in the description. Thank you so much for being here. This has been awesome. It's been fun. Thanks very much, Benji. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.